Welcome to lesson three. So, um, I thought it was interesting when uh, when John prayed this morning. He said he he said uh, he asked to keep the sermon from uh, from error. He prayed that you would be kept from error, which is an interesting thing because that implies that God has control over what you say. Um, which if if our wills are independent of God, that's not true. So, um, the, uh, the implications of, of free will, which is what we're going to be talking about again today, you know, filter down into, into what you say when you pray. So, um, this is a pretty, pretty big deal. Um, so let's, uh, let's just remind ourselves what the overall problem is that we're, we're dealing with, and that is the problem of evil. So this is one way of putting it here. Um, if, if God is uh, morally good and he's omnipotent and if we assume that a morally good being or a morally good God can't cause evil and that e evil exists, we seem to arrive at a paradox um, because if God is morally good and evil exists, then, then he must be omnipotent. He must not be omnipotent, sorry, um, otherwise he would put an end to evil. Uh, on the other hand, if he's omnipotent and evil exists, then he must not be good because he's producing evil, right? Um, so that's kind of what we're what we're shooting to uh, to answer ultimately. Today we're looking to remove one of the options, which is free will. So free will says, in solution to this to this paradox, well, God is omnipotent in that he's all powerful, but he, that doesn't mean he controls everything. So so God has decided not to control men's wills. Um, not that he couldn't, but he's just decided not to. And therefore, they, they seek to maintain omnipotence um, and um, goodness at the same time. So uh, we're going to try to remove that. Once that's out of the way, we will be able to more clearly see what the correct solution to the problem is. Um, let's just remind ourselves of where we've been and where we're going. So this is the lesson plan. Lesson one is to, was to appreciate the problem, so just understand what's involved in coming up with a solution to this problem. And then we saw that there's pretty much two possibilities, uh, Christian possible solutions. One is free will, and the other one is to deny premise three, which you'll remember is that a morally good God cannot cause evil. If we deny that and say that a morally good God can cause evil, we also solve the problem. It's just that's uh, not a very attractive solution. So free will is an alternative. If we can remove free will, we're kind of forced into, uh, into the other. Okay, so we started that process uh, last, last time in lesson two. So um, basically, we, we uh, tried to figure out what free will is, and then I gave two logical criticisms of it, one being that it really doesn't solve the problem of evil because if God is giving permission to evil, he's still involved in the whole thing. It doesn't really remove him of guilt. And then number two, uh, free will is inconsistent with foreknowledge. So that if the Bible teaches foreknowledge, as we've heard this morning, uh, in terms of prophecy, um, if the Bible can in fact prophesy that the Medes would take over Babylon, which is predicated on the Medes' decision, then that decision must be predetermined. Um, and we saw how the, the, the free will sol uh, solutions to that problem really don't, don't work. Um, and then we gave one scriptural example um, of Pharaoh and the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, which, which is scriptural proof. Uh, this week, lesson three, we're going to look at a bunch more scriptural proof, which um, is not going to only prove that God could cause free will if he wanted, or could cause evil if he wanted to, but that he actually does. So... Uh, next week, we're going to be looking at the, the verses that are supposedly on the other side and to see whether you know, the, the Bible uh, gives any credence to the idea that, that men do have free choice. So we're going to explain those texts. And then we're, once we've got that out of the way, we're, we can start positively constructing a solution to this problem. And the reason you might say, why, why three whole lessons on free will? And that may be a bit excessive. Well, it's not. And the reason is is that free will is not only a solution to the problem of evil, it's at the base of an entire theology, especially an entire theory of justice and guilt. And uh, we'll, we'll see that more clearly uh, later on, but 
for now, think about think about the phrase the soul uh, the soul that sinneth it shall die. Um, if you sin, you will die. If you had if you had the free choice of sinning, then you die. Um, so the common idea of, of justice is that you are only punished if, in fact, you made a free choice. If God controls men's choices, then no choice is free, and therefore we have to come up with a new theory of justice, of what constitutes a guilty person. So this is much bigger than just, than just the, uh, the issue, the basic issue of whether or not God controls decisions. It's a whole theory, a whole theology of, of uh, quite a bit, even beyond justice. So, um, we will begin this uh, positive construction with uh, proving that God does in fact cause evil, and then we, the next two lessons will deal with responsibility, which is constructing a new theory of justice that is not dependent on free will. And then finally, applying in Lesson 8 what we've learned in terms of the problem of evil to the problems of atonement and original sin, because the problems at their root both have to, deal, have to do with guilt and justice. So when we have a correct interpretation of justice, the problems of how guilt can be transferred to an innocent person become very obvious. Does that? Um, does anyone have any questions? Or is that clear where we are? Where we are right now? So, this question: free from what? Uh, I just want to go back a little bit and remind us of what free will is. It's Free will is kind of notoriously convoluted, but if you can remember to ask this question, you are 90% of the way to understanding the problem of free will completely. Just the, the, so the question is, free from what? You cannot assert that something free is free without saying what it's free from. So if I were just to stand up here and say that I'm free, there could be a million different things that I'm free from. Maybe I'm free from jail. Um, maybe I'm... Uh, Maybe I'm free from water. I'm not in the water. There's a million things that I could be free from. So when we're talking about a freedom of the will, we got to ask, what is it that the, we're saying the will is free from? And there are pretty much three things, three forms of determinism, three things that could control the will that uh, have been proposed. And I was wondering if anyone can remember one of them. Um, so these are three things that potentially could control men's decisions. Um, can anyone throw one out there? What, what is one form of, of uh, determinism? Right, so like uh, maybe by that you mean uh, physical determinism. Yeah. So your environment or your even your physical brain is what is controlling your decisions. Okay, so in terms of in terms of uh, you are, your will is limited by what it has the ability to control. So our wills can only control, for instance, our bodies um, and our thoughts and, and that kind of thing. We don't have the ability to control the universe like God does. However, that's not really a statement of freedom from something. That's a statement of, uh, of limit, limitation. Um, what, is, what is something that the will could be controlled by uh, possibly. Uh, one, in, one, one for instance, uh, well let me just uh, put them up here. So these are, these are the, the three things. Um, so psychological determinism is the idea that a, a man's psychology or his mind controls his will such that a man will always choose his strongest motivation. Okay? So if I'm presented with um, you know, eating steak versus uh, eating something undesirable, like grass, I'm always going to choose the steak because that will be my strongest motivation. And, I, and, and my choice is wholly determined by what I believe is the best course of action. Uh, a second form would be divine determinism, whether or not God controls the will. Uh, and then lastly, physical determinism, which would be whether or not the universe or your body, the, the laws of physics, control your will. So, um, you know, you might say, well, the chemical reactions in your brain is what is controlling your decisions. Um, maybe, maybe that's the case. So those are the kind of the three options. Uh, here is a breakdown of, uh, of Arminianism versus Calvinism on these issues. If you can, uh, if you can remember 
to ask the question, free from what, and you can get a basic idea of what's on this slide, you have understood the problem of free will completely. Um, Arminianism, Arminianism rejects all three. So it says the conclusion of Arminianism is that the will is indeterminate, such that when you come to a fork in the road and you can only go one way, it's totally indeterminate which way you're going to go. It could be you could go this way or this way, and there's no way to predict it. Nobody, not even God, knows the, knows the outcome of your decision. Calvinism, on the other hand, accepts two of these forms of determinism. Um, it accepts psychological and divine determinism. So uh, think about the doctrine of uh, total depravity. So the Calvinism asserts that if a, a man cannot choose to believe uh, the gospel without a, you know, a modification of his nature in regeneration. So that is a statement of psychological control of the will you know, by, the, by the man's sinful nature, right? Does that make sense? Uh, that's a form of determinism. There's also divine determinism such that God is controlling the whole process. You know, ultimately, whether or not, whether directly or indirectly, God has predetermined every human action, every human decision. But it's important to remember that Calvinism and Arminianism agree on physical determinism. They both reject that the brain or your environment around you can determine your decision. In other words, this is basically just to say that decisions are made spiritually, not physically. Okay? Such that you look totally confused. Who? Calvinists, you mean? Okay. Well, um, really both of, both of these camps would agree that your, that your mind is taking account of the data that is coming through the senses, but that is, the decision is made spiritually. So it's not to say that the, your physical surroundings are not taken into account by your mind. However, your mind is not physical. Um, you might... Uh, you might think of the, the thief on the cross. Christ said, you will be with me today in paradise. That evening, his body was in the ground. Like His body was not in paradise. But the, the thief himself, the mind, was in paradise. Such that the two are distinct, right? And the mind can do praising, can praise God, and so forth, independently of the body. So the, um, the mind uses the body as a tool, basically. And it ga it's an information-gathering tool and an active tool, but the brain, the physical chemical reactions in the brain is not what is making the decision. It's still the mind, not, not the mind. It's the, the spirit of a man not a, that has no physical location. Does that make sense? Okay. That, that, it, that has always been the Christian position regardless of either of these two views. Uh, and that is why uh, both reject physical determinism. Um, so if you read the Westminster or the London Baptist Confession, you will find a, a, a paragraph on free will. And you might be surprised at that when they both, you know, when, when they both re accept a form of determinism. Um, but the reason is, if you look at that, it talks about a natural liberty. And what they're talking about is a liberty from natural forces, the forces of nature. It's a rejection of physical determinism, not psychological and divine determinism. Okay? Any questions? That was a very good question, by the way. That shows you we're thinking about it. Anything else? Okay, this is the, this is the background then. So, a definition of, the free, of free will. Um, we can't make any progress if we don't know exactly what we're talking about. And that is this. A man faced with incompatible courses of action can choose any one as well as any other. The outcome of a decision is truly indeterminate. <clears throat> now, some people get confused here and say, isn't that just a definition of choice itself? Well, no. This is a definition of a free choice. Here's a definition of a choice, and this is from Gordon Clark. A choice is a mental act that consciously initiates and determines a further action. Now, notice there, there's no statement of freedom. This act could be spontaneous. This mental act, it could be free. It could be not free. It could be controlled by something else. It's still a choice. 
regardless of whether it's controlled or not. This is how it is, it is possible for the Bible to assert that, that men make decisions even though those decisions, decisions are completely predetermined and controlled. Okay? Any questions on that? The free will? <clears throat> so, uh, you know, that, that's saying that um, when a man comes to, to make a choice, um, there's, there's no determinacy going on. He could, it could, it could go either way. Right, exactly. According to free will, it could go either way, and nobody, not even God, knows the outcome. Um, according to, according to free will, yes. Yes. Um, according to a, a Calvinistic definition, he still made a choice. He still, he still made that mental act that caused him to write down Fruit Loops. Um, it's just that, you know, that God had already decided that that's what he was going to be doing. Um, and plus, and plus, he apparently wanted Fruit Loops more than he wanted the whatever Frosted Flakes or whatever. So. Um, Let's keep that in mind, and now we're going to move into the scriptures. So I've mostly gotten scriptures here from the Old Testament. Um, you might be surprised at that. We might think that perhaps the Old Testament isn't as theological as the New Testament. Um, actually, as you're going to see here, the Old Testament goes out of its way to disprove free will. And it's not just, it's not just like it does it once or twice. This is a theme. We're going to see many, many books from the Old Testament. It's, pro it's possible to disprove books free will from almost any book of the Bible. Um, and then we're just going to see a couple passages from the New Testament to just confirm that the New Testament doesn't modify the teaching of the Old Testament. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Genesis 15, 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, this is to Abraham, This, that's Eleazar, shall not be thine heir, but he that cometh forth from thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Now you might say, what does this have to do with free will? Well, the question is, could have Abraham the day afterwards chosen to, uh, chosen to commit suicide, for instance? You see, the, uh, the outcome of this, the fact that Abraham was going to have an heir from his own bowels was, de was dependent on Abraham living and not committing suicide. Okay? So Abraham's choice must have been controlled. This is kind of an example of, many, of a whole you know, theme of prophecy of, of human decisions in the Old Testament. Um, this is about the only one I'm going to bring up, but right from the beginning here, we see that God is predicting human decisions. Um, Abraham could not have, you know, left his wife. Um, he couldn't have divorced her either. You know, he, they had to stay together in order to produce a child. There's only one way to produce a child, right? God determines Abraham's decisions. Okay. Um, let's move on. Maybe that was just an anomaly. Well, Gen Genesis 26 says, I also, this is uh, talking to Abimelech, pagan king, I also withheld thee from sinning against me, therefore I suffered thee not to touch her. That was uh, Sarah. He kidnapped, or not kidnapped, just took her. Um, took Sarah. But God was overseeing his decisions. See what it says here. He withheld him from sinning. He didn't let him do it. Could have Abimelech, if Abimelech had free will, he should have been able to choose to do what he, you know. Right here it says that he withheld him from sinning. Okay? That's a statement of control. Genesis 50, 20. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. This is Joseph talking to his brothers. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Here we kind of get a peek behind the scenes, right? People are down here making their decisions. God's up here. He has his overall plan. This could not, it says God meant it unto good. This, that means it was part of God's plan. You don't have a plan unless you already know what's, what's going on. You, you, God had to be in control and know what the outcome was, would be in order to have it as part of his plan. Right? Okay. Deuteronomy, another book by Moses. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass, 
by him, for the Lord God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate. Again, very similar to the wording of talking about Pharaoh. He made his heart obstinate. This is God directly controlling a human decision. Deuteronomy 30. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, so he's going to do something to their heart, such that the heart will love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind that thou mayest live. So God's doing something to their heart that results in something they do, you know, which has lasting, a lasting effect on their eternal state. This is a statement, a clear statement of election. So again, no, no free will there, no free will. First Samuel, moving away from Moses. Everything we've seen up till now was Moses. So I think we know pretty clearly the position of Moses on free will. Uh, what about Samuel? For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Again, another clear statement of God's the one who chooses his people. How do you become a, a person of God? By believing the gospel, right? Or by, you know, following, following Jehovah in the Old Testament. So, how do, those decisions to do that you know, were a result of God's good pleasure. God was in charge of the whole thing. Another uh, statement from 1 Samuel. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Okay, you might say, well, the spirit was troubling them. That doesn't mean he controlled his decisions. Well, it says next verse, And Paul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from the Lord, from God, troubleth thee. So, the evil spirit had a modification of Saul's behavior such that his servants noticed it, right? Without the evil spirit, Saul wouldn't have been acted in a troubled way. So here we have the spirit from God controlling Saul's decisions to an extent, at least that it modified his behavior somewhat, okay? Not free will. Here's Absalom. And Absalom and all the men of Israel, the council said, uh, sorry, said, and Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the counsel of Hushai the Archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. And here's why they said that. For the Lord had appointed to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. So, you know, these guys made a decision. They decided which one was better. But God was in charge of the whole thing. Moving on to Kings. And the Lord said, who shall be persuade Ahab? So this is, this is that situation where the two kings are there trying to decide whether they're going to go out to battle. And uh, here's a little, another peep behind the scenes. Um, again, the Old Testament narrative, just notice, it didn't have to tell us this. Um, you can talk about two kings making a decision without, without mentioning you know, the, what was going on in heaven. But here we go. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said in this manner, and another said in this that manner. And there came forth a spirit, and stood before the Lord, and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he, that's God, said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also, go forth and do so. So the spirit has a plan. God says, Go ahead. And by the way, you're not going to fail. You're going to succeed. So God already knows the outcome of this whole thing. He's already determined what the outcome is going to be. Now, you might say, if, if God was already controlling their decisions, why did he need a lying spirit to go do it? Well, see, this is a great example of how just because God is in control doesn't mean he doesn't use means. You see, God has initiated a lot of things, but he is... He generally uses means in his creation to bring about his ends. He doesn't necessarily go right into your head and, and modify your decisions just like that. He decided to use a lying spirit this time. Um, but that doesn't mean he wasn't completely in control. So you see, the Bible's position on, on this is not, is not just simplistic. It's, it's got a certain amount of, uh, of complexity with, to it, um, such that God can use means to accomplish his ends. Okay. Uh, Second Chronicles. So the king hearkened not to the people, for the cause was of God that the Lord might perform his word. So the reason he didn't hearken was because um, the cause was of God. The Lord wanted to perform his word. 
this might be, hopefully this isn't tedious, this is a lot of verses, but I just, I don't want to leave any doubt. What we're trying to prove here is that this is a theme. It's not just a, in a these verses are not anomalies. It's a theme. The, the Old Testament wanted us to get this. Okay? Second Chronicles. But Amaziah would not hear, for it came of God that he might deliver them into the hand of their enemies because they sought after the gods of Edom. You're starting to notice a pattern here. If you want to have free will, don't be a king. All right? God has a, a particular pension for controlling king's wills. All right? Um, Ezra. And kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them to strengthen their hands and to work uh, to the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Turn the heart of the king of Assyria. Direct action. Here's Job. <clears throat> Possibly the earliest book of the Bible um, in terms of chronology. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. I only am escaped to tell thee. Okay, so God and Satan have this little conference. God says, go do your thing. And then the Sabaeans come and actually do it. So Satan was controlling the Sabaeans, right? The Sabaeans were not exercising free will. They, wouldn't, they might not have done this except for Satan's control. Satan was, was the one in control here. That, this also proves that you know, there's other... God doesn't just use one means to his ends. Like here's God using Satan, and, you know, an evil spirit, to produce his results. Let's move to Psalms. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. Again, a clear statement. A clear statement that God is the one causing you to do something, namely approach him. He turned the heart of their people, or sorry, he turned their heart to hate his people and to deal subtly with his servants. Very clear. Moving to Proverbs. The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So the preparations would be your, your ideas, you know, your your thinking, you know, am I going to do this, am I going to do that, and then you make a decision, and then, and then you actually, something comes out of your mouth. So from the preparations all the way to the answer of the tongue, that whole process is of the Lord. God is over, overseeing the whole process. Proverbs 16, 4, the Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. So God already knows when he creates someone whether they're going to be good or evil. He creates the wicked so that they will be evil. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. So all kings, all kings are under, have no free will. Okay, let's go to Isaiah. The princes of Zoan are become fools, and the princes of Naf are deceived. They have also seduced Egypt, even they that, um, that are the stay of the tribes thereof. The Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof and caused Egypt to err, etc., so God sent this spirit for the purpose of making them err, and it succeeded. Here's the first mention of the, well, not the first mention, but um, here's an example of the potter's clay theme. That we're gonna, it's gonna, this is going to become important when we get to Romans. Um, Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as potter's clay. For shall the work say to him that made it, he made me not? Or the thing framed, say to him that framed it, he hath no understanding. We'll just notice here that the clay here, the, the point of clay in the Bible is that clay has no rights. Um, the potter can do what he wants with the clay, and the clay you know, can't say, well, you had no understanding, I shouldn't be like this, da 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 The clay has no rights. It just is what it is, and it has to be that way. Keep that in mind. It's going to come up in Romans. 43. This people have I formed for myself, that they shall show forth my praise. Again, God regenerating people in order to get them to do what he wants them to do. Here's Isaiah 45. Um, this, is a, this is a very powerful passage. Thus saith the Lord, his in, 
to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loosen loose the loins of kings to open before him two leaved gates. The gates shall not be shut, for Jacob my servants and Israel mine elect I have called by thy name, I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside thee. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Let's pause right there. I girded thee, or I, I formed thee, I did things to you, even though you didn't know me, or you didn't know it. In other words, God can control you, even if you don't know it. So a common Arminian idea might be, well, I just, I just know that I have free will because I can feel it. Like if I, if, if I you know, want to choose cornflakes or Cheerios or whatever, I can do that, right? Well, just because you think you have free will doesn't mean you do. It says God girded them without them knowing him. They, they didn't realize what was going on. Okay, this next verse is probably never hear an Arminian sermon on this one. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. Oops. I, the Lord, do all these things. God is in charge of everything. He just does everything. All right? But that's not where it ends. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, What makest thou? Or the work? He hath no hands. Let's just pause there. Here's the potter's clay again. What's the point here? The clay has no rights. It can't say, you know, What are you doing? What, are you, what makest thou? That's like an accusation. This is not an honest question by the clay. The clay does not really want to know what's going on. He's saying, he's saying, what right have you to make me like this? And God is saying, no, you have no rights. You're clay. All right? Woe unto him that saith to his father, what begettest thou? Or to the woman, what hast thou brought forth? I have raised him, this is Cyrus again, up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city. He shall let me. He shall let go my captives, not for price or reward, saith the Lord of hosts. You really, if this was the only ver passage of the Bible that you had, you definitely would not come up with free will from this from this chapter. Okay, what about the next chapter? Here uh, clearly says, declaring the end in bold. There, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done saying, My counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. And then in the next verse, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. God makes predictions, and he brings them about. Lamentations. Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commanded it not? In other words, God is in charge of everything. Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not good and evil. This is a rhetorical question. Yes, God creates evil, he creates good, just like it said in Isaiah. Here we have another, in Ezekiel now, um, passage about regeneration, verse 27 there. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Daniel, and the king, and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that, that is sorry, for that that is determined, shall be done. This is interesting because notice in the first it says in the first line there, the king shall do according to his will. This this uh, Daniel does not see any discrepancy between saying that the king is making a choice and saying that that choice was predetermined. See, Daniel was comfortable with that idea. There's no contradiction there. The reason being that choices could be free or not free, that's not part of the definition of choice. Okay? That's, that concludes uh, the Old Testament, and there's so much that I could have put in here. This, this list could be many times as long. But does that, is that sufficient to show that this is an Old Testament theme? So now all we have to do is make sure that the New Testament doesn't modify that. Um, so I've got three passages here. Philippians. <clears throat> Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Now just notice again here, 
Paul has no problem with saying, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, and in the next sentence, to say that God is the one working in you to do whatever he wants. You see, Paul didn't have this, this conflict. He understood that those two are, are consistent, that a choice does not have to be free to be a choice. Acts 4.27 for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and counsel determined before to be done. That Pilate's decision to condemn Jesus was controlled by God. Yes? Pilate, Gentiles, and Israel. Right, right. Herod's decision to send them back to Pilate. The Gentiles, that would be the Roman soldiers, I guess. The, uh, the people of Israel, the crowd, clamoring for his... Everybody. I don't know what matter will. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I wouldn't that passage we were just talking about Pilate. <coughs> yeah, no. I was just pulling them out as an example. Romans 9. So I'm just going to kind of read through this passage. It, it, it really doesn't even hardly need comment. Um, it, it's so clear. Um, but let's, let's, let's see what he says. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, for the, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. Okay, so God's predicting what the, what the two children are going to do. The elder is going to serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith unto Moses, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion upon whom I will have, com upon whom I will have compassion. What, what is Paul saying here? He's saying God can do what he wants to do, right? He, he's not accountable to men. Um, that's why there's no unrighteousness with God. Justice does not depend on the rights of men. Men have no rights. Okay? So, verse 16. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, here comes that theme from last week, Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up that I might show my power in thee, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Okay? Hardening. Hardening of hearts there. Okay, so what do we say then in verse, verse 19? Wilt thou say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault for who hath resisted his will? Okay, that's the natural response. Isn't it great that Paul anticipated what any Arminian is going to say to you if you argue with them? They're going to bring up this argument. Um, if my choices are predetermined, then... How can I be responsible for something that, that I had no choice? Well, there's a fallacy right there because they did have a choice. They did make the choice. They just, it was controlled. But let that pass. How can it be, how can it be, how can I be responsible if my choice was predetermined? Well, here's the answer. Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. Now there's a, there's a, there's a thought, a common thought here that this is saying that, well, the potter really can't understand, or the clay really can't understand the potter. And so the clay really shouldn't be asking these questions, right? That's not what's going on here. This is not a statement that the clay has no understanding. This is a statement that the clay has no rights. Hath not the potter power over the clay? Can't the potter do with the clay what he wants? Right? It's his clay. He can do whatever he wants. The clay has no rights. And again, these are not honest questions. You know the difference when your child comes, if you tell your child to do something and they say, sure, I'll, I'm happy to do that. I just, um, what's the overall plan here? Like, what, well, That's an honest question, right? Or if he said, the child says, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, Why do I have to do that? That's not an honest question. That's saying, I shouldn't have to do this. That's an accusation. That's saying, I have rights, and I don't want to do this. Paul is saying, no, men don't have any rights. 
God can do whatever he wants. This then, by way of anticipation, is the solution to the problem of evil. If, if God is in fact, has created justice and created law, then God is above the law. And God, and God we have no rights with respect to God. We cannot, we cannot call God to account. In fact, nobody can call God to account. If God is going to be guilty, there must be someone for him to be guilty to. And therefore, since God is be, as the supreme being, is the supreme being, he cannot be guilty by definition. We're going to get a lot more into that later. But suffice it to say now, Paul does in fact completely solve the problems of evil right here in this passage. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory to the vessels of mercy which he hath before prepared unto glory? And here again, the very end is a clear statement that God is the one preparing people unto glory and fitting them unto destruction. It's not a matter of, of indeterminacy. God controls these decisions. Questions? That's, that is the last verse here. What do you guys think? Yes. Uh, are, are we saying that Satan can control men or that Satan provides uh, temptations to men? Uh, the idea of Satan controlling almost puts him on a par with with the Lord. I, I'm not exactly sure what you were getting at there. Well, Satan, we know that Satan does not have omnipotent control, um, but that's not to say that he can't control things. And certainly, if someone were to, uh, perhaps, you would be more comfortable with with uh, if someone put themselves under the power of Satan or something and like swore allegiance to Satan. Perhaps Satan would have control of their mind to some extent, even the idea of bringing a temptation to somebody implies some control over somebody's mind. Um, how can you put a temptation into somebody's mind um, if you don't have some level of control to create a thought, right? To communicate without, you know, not physically. We can only communicate physically. Satan apparently can, can communicate directly with our minds. Um, <laughs> Wouldn't you agree, though, that God gave him permission to do that, and therefore Satan has the right. has the ability to do it if God gives him permission? And, and certainly, yes, it's it's only as much as God gives him permission. Is God controlling Satan? It would certainly appear so in the passage from Job. Um, Satan couldn't do what he what he wanted to do without God's authorization. Right, so it's not like Satan has free will. No, no, nobody has free will. <laughs> Just a comment. Um, <clears throat> many years ago, when I was much younger, um, I sat under some teaching, and this particular guy, which I think is not a great argument, but his guy I really respected, and I believed at the time, was saying, you know, God had certain things planned that he decided a foreknowledge this will happen. But there's tons of other things. So you have the king's examples, you know, obviously Jesus on the cross, and you know, David, every, you know, he knows his days ahead of time. But that doesn't necessarily mean, universally speaking, that's a, the case for every single person. How would you have so any comment your, on that? Is, your, is what you're saying that God has, you might say, certain fixed points in history that are yes. determined, but it's indeterminate which course of events will lead to those points. Exactly. So you might say there's, uh, there's two cities and there's you know, three roads to get to the other city. It's, uh, if, you, if you set out, it's determinate that you're going to get there, but there's three diff indeterminate ways of getting there, exactly. right? That's exactly what he's saying. Okay. That, that is a very common way of, of trying to uh, get rid of this problem. The, pro the problem is uh, it, it's not... That doesn't explain these, these verses because, for instance, in the case of, uh, of Jesus, so the argument would be um, Christ, Christ was going to die on the cross. If Pilate had decided to release him, 
then God would have found another way to get him killed. Right? That would be the, the argument. Except that that verse in Acts says that they were all gathered together to do whatsoever God had already planned. In other words, God had already determined that Pilate, it mentions Pilate's name, that Pilate was going to do that. I think, I think he would just say some of the decisions God makes happen, he has to step in to make sure it happens. He hardens hearts. He does this and that for certain people to make sure it happens. But you and I, in the course of our lives, have a different level of freedom unless it's, you know, the, the certain things in history that were important, then God makes sure they happen. You know. I mean, I, I, I don't buy the, the, the argument. I mean, I'm just, the, just the issue there becomes, though, Let's say, let's say we grant that, like how does that solve any of the problems we're trying to deal with here? Um, if God even controlled one evil decision, that makes God, that makes God evil, right? If, if you're going to follow the free will line of reasoning. The whole idea behind free will is to distance God from evil. Um, once you say that God controls some evil decisions, then, but, but it also becomes much more complicated because so let's say uh, you know all the decisions that went into Pilate getting put there in uh, in the first place like back at Rome you know he was a provincial governor um, all the you know all the decisions that led to his birth you see the the events of the world are all they're tied together um, it's a it's a big spider's web and if you fix one point or especially if you fix hundreds of points like the Bible <laughs> asserts you fixed pretty much everything. Um, and again, we have all these statements in the Bible where God, it specifically says that God did control a specific decision. Um, so if you've, if you've abandoned the broader theory of free will, um, you really got to ask, why are, you even, why are you even still holding on to this? Um, the same speaker brought up the, um, you know, God testing them to find out what they would do, God being surprised by this decision. And he, he had a whole slew of his own right. verses. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you're going to tap uh, what that's, it is. That's what we're going to be dealing with next, next week. Okay, I got um, <laughs> but, yeah. You might, uh, it, let's, take, let's take just for one, the case of Isaac. Um being sacrificed on the altar. Um, you know, it says that God was testing Abraham, right? Um, God had already promised Abraham before that that his descendants were going to be like the sand of the sea. Um, and that, you know, it was through Isaac that you know, his seed would go forward. Abraham, did God not know what the outcome was going to be? It seems that he must have because he already made those promises. Um, so if you, if you say that God was testing him in the sense that he really didn't know what the outcome of the test would be, then you arrive at a contradiction. So we, we have to avoid contradictions um, if we're going to stay, if we're going to still believe that the Bible is inerrant. So what we have to realize then is that, well, maybe the idea of a test does not presuppose indeterminacy. Maybe God can be testing him without you know, already knowing what the outcome will be. Uh, maybe maybe uh, I believe that that wall, I can probably run against it and I probably won't go through. You know, it's got studs and drywall and then there's lockers on the other side. I don't think I'm gonna make it through. You might even say that I know I'm not gonna make it through, but maybe I decide to test it. Can I not be testing it without knowing what the outcome will be? Maybe a test, maybe the fact that God is testing that God tests men doesn't mean that the outcome isn't already determined. These are the, th it's, the same, it's the same root issue as saying um, choice does not involve freedom. Choice is different from free choice. A test is different from an indeterminate outcome test. You see, these are the mistakes that Arminians make again and again and again when they're interpreting scripture. It might not be. Question, but so the, the issue that we have with free will is the fact that God looks evil if we don't have free will. 
he is creating the evil in the world. So that's the issue. But he's not actually doing the evil himself. The vessels are doing the evil. Is there any verses in the Bible that say that God is not evil? Like specifically states that he is not. That he is morally good. Yeah. In other words, um, it's a lot easier to find verses that say he's just than that he's morally good. Um, justice being the idea of always punishing sin. Um, but uh, I'd have to get back to you on that. I don't have anything anything uh, offhand. Like that. But uh, it would seem, you know, that part of the problem here is we, uh, we take a human-to-human -human relationship and assume that it's the same between humans and God. So, um, you know, we say, so if, I'm, if I plan a murder and then hire somebody to carry it out, I'm the cause. I didn't actually do the murder, right? But I'm still guilty. Um, so we say if God is the one orchestrating the sin, he must also be guilty. Uh, but there's there's no reason to believe that that would have to be the case. Uh, perhaps perhaps God is in fact above the law and He can do whatever He wants. Um, perhaps He's not governed by these things. Yes. Come on out. To Ryan's point, do people would would he say that would that same guy say that things are different from the Old Testament to the New Testament even to now? <laughs> Two, would he have like two different gods? Would he have no, I don't think so. I don't think so. He's actually a progressive in the sense that he believes from day one there, there's always been progress. There's not a dispensational on any. He was disparate. He was a very much against dispensationalism. And it's always getting better and better. He, I mean, I don't think his his uh, theories, you know, are extremely popular. You know, mainstream. You know. He had all. I mean, it was a new experience for a lot of the things he said for the first time I heard. Him. I think I listened to it a couple times and try to understand where he was coming from. By the time I was like, "Boy, this really makes sense," you yeah, know. But anyway, <clears throat> it was many moons ago. <laughs> yes. Do people ever drag Christ into this during his humanity here on his stay here? In terms of whether or not he had free will, um, is that addressed in in the readings that you've done? Is it that's not as, as big of an issue because Christ didn't do any sin. So even if we would assume that Christ didn't have free will, did or didn't, it doesn't matter a whole lot in terms of the relationship between God and evil. Um, does that make sense? So, however, that said, there's there's a couple of he decided to not go to the cross. He said in the garden, you know. I, I could ask right. my father and he would send. Right. It, it's not as... Christ is acknowledged by everyone to have been a special case. So what you would prove in terms of Christ can't doesn't really... Necess so even if you say, well, yes, it's certain Christ didn't have free will uh, in his humanity, it doesn't automatically apply. That's why I didn't bring him in as a proof. However, you know, that is certainly true. Um, if he had decided not to go to the cross, all of the Old Testament would have False. But he is God. And but, so no. He's above it anyway. Right, right. In a sense. But maybe right. not in right. his humanity. Right. There's always, uh, in, in terms of these discussions, there's always two special cases that, that you have to deal with, and that's Adam and Christ. And, and um, them both being different than the rest of humanity. But anyway, that's, that's a little bit of a, a tangent. I don't have time to flesh that out. But you're right, Christ didn't have free will either. I'm really curious what you're going to tell us. Okay, I'll just read the verse. We can read it. This is God talking. Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers? Who says of Cyrus, who wasn't born at the time? Uh, he is my shepherd. He shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built into the temple. Your foundation shall be laid. So the guy wasn't even alive at the time. Um, Where's that? It's Isaiah 44, 28. Okay. Um, you're going to do my will. And I'm sure, I'd say, I'm sure Cyrus wasn't like, like, uh, oh, I don't want to rebuild the temple. You know, we see in Ezra that was on the other side. Oh, I don't want to do it, but I, you know, there's some outside power forcing my hand to sign this. No, I mean, Cyrus thinks the whole time he's 
right? But it turns out he's doing God's work the whole, the whole time. And, and the, to what you were saying earlier, there's so much things that have to go into this. Somewhere there has to be a mother and father who name a child Cyrus. He has to be conceived. He has to not get killed. Right, not only does he not have to get killed, everyone in his ancestry has to not get killed before that, yeah, yeah. You know, or else his genetics would be modified and he's not who he is or whatever. It, it's, you know, it just poof, yeah. blows up just like that. It's just too much. I think one other thing that we, that, that here in the States we don't get as much is King Jesus, a monarch, loyal subjects. Like Seth and I talk about it. A monarchy is actually the right way to do this. A king. Is it already instilled in people that they have no rights? Except the king. What if, uh, what if what is so terrible on a human level to have an absolute despot is not so terrible when it comes to a divine? So that, that's basically what you're getting at, right? Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for your attention. Um, I, I stopped by quarter of. <laughs> just for just for the record, I stopped by quarter of. <laughs> Thank you very much.